Political Philosophy is a Morin Academy podcast. If you'd like to know more about the Morin Academy, see the notes below. I've provided links to our website, our newsletter, which is free, and you will get some information about the upcoming classes that we're going to offer. But included among them is this fall, Spencer Hess and myself will be offering a class on Wendell Berry's The Unsettling of America. But as of now, I need to get back into Eric Vogelin's little book here, Science, Politics, and Gnosticism. And this part is dealing with what he calls Erzat's religion, which I guess I'll translate as um, false religion uh, or a poor substitute for religion. So what's he talking about? Well, I'll try to explain that. So in this section, towards the end of the book, Vogelin is going to talk about different modes of immanentization, um, which is the bringing down of of the heavenly or the transcendent to earth, the attempt by human beings to bring the transcendent to the here and now, which Vogelin um, obviously thinks is a mistake. And he thinks that it's a mistake that's been happening, not just in modern times, but throughout history, especially since the advent of Christianity. And so we'll get all into that uh, in this particular episode. So he starts off this section by saying, by the Gnostic movements, we mean such movements as progressivism, positivism, Marxism, psychoanalysis, communism, fascism, and national socialism. And I'll just pause for a second and say, in a lot of the rest of this book, he's primarily focused on Marxism, but here we do get an acknowledgement that it's not just Marxism that is a problem in modern times, it is all of these types of isms. He says, we are not dealing, therefore, in all of these cases with political mass movements, because notice, for instance, positivism or psychoanalysis. These are not mass movements in the classic sense, they're intellectual movements. So we're not dealing in all of these cases with political mass movements. Some of them would be more accurately characterized as intellectual movements. This draws attention to the fact that mass movements do not represent an autonomous phenomenon and that the difference between ma masses and intellectual elites is perhaps not so great as is conventionally assumed, if indeed it exists at all. I love that point because I think that intellectuals oftentimes want to try to distinguish themselves from the masses and tell themselves that they cannot become susceptible to the type of thinking that gets people into trouble ideologically because they say to themselves they're dealing only with the facts and using reason. But I would say my own personal experience, as well as my experience of other um, academics and intellectuals, is that they very much can engage in Gnostic thinking, too. It's very difficult. I think one of the things that um, this book really brings out is just how difficult it is to extract yourself from this way of thinking, because it has very deep, uh, long origins. Uh, and it is quite thoroughly embedded, it would seem, in the human psyche. And so uh, it is not at all easy to escape it. And in this section, he's going to describe more what it is that it's so hard to escape. So he points out that mass movements and intellectual movements are always connected. Uh, movements start out with one or more people having ideas that are so, sort of inherently attractive because they are in effect eschatological. They have like this promise of perfection, this promise of somehow transcending our existing order, making things right. So the intellectual has the idea, and then sometimes that idea then gets taken up by people, political actors, and ordinary people, and they move it forward, oftentimes in a sort of perverted, 
uh, way, not the purest way. Maybe you could argue that not the way that the original thinkers intended, but that's kind of inevitable that what is in the mind of the intellectual is not going to be preserved in its perfection, right? Um, so each and every one of these people, Marx, Nietzsche, Locke, and Thomas Jefferson, uh, would all probably be shaking their head at what has been made of their particular um, ideas, all right? Nevertheless, they are inextricable, the intellectual ideas and the mass movements. So I think that's a very good point that he makes. One of the examples that he discusses briefly um, is of Auguste Comte and positivism. Uh, as a intellectual movement that's Gnostic. Um, and he gives Comte as an example. He says, a brief outline of Comtean positivism may serve as a representative example of how mass and intellectual movements are connected. Positivism was an intellectual movement that began with Saint Simon and Comte and his friends and was intended by its founders to become a mass movement of worldwide extent. So we're basically talking about um, secular humanism here. So the idea here was that Comte's positivism was meant to be by him and by other positivists, a mass movement, and that they in effect treated it as though it was a, a sort of substitute for religion. He says the entire Western world can thank Comte and for the word altruism, the secular imminent substitute for love, which is associated with Christianity. Altruism is the basis of the conception of a brotherhood of man without a father. All right, so there's an example of a an intellectual Gnostic with pretensions to a mass movement who had a huge impact, and one cannot call it an ideological movement in the political sense, perhaps, but it had far-ranging consequences for how people think. So then next, um, he reprises the six characteristics of the Gnostic attitude. And so you can think of various thinkers and movements as I move through these six characteristics. First, he says, it must be pointed out that the Gnostic is dissatisfied with his situation. This in itself is not especially surprising. We all have cause to be not completely satisfied with one aspect or another of the situation in which we find ourselves. First pointed out, he says, the Gnostic is dissatisfied with his situation, not really an unusual human state of affairs. Not quite so understandable is the second aspect of the Gnostic attitude, the belief that the drawbacks of the situation can be attributed to the fact that the world is intrinsically poorly organized. For it is likewise possible to assume that the order of being as it is given to us men is good and that it is we humans who are inadequate. But Gnostics are not inclined to discover that human beings in general, and they themselves in particular, are inadequate. That's really like loaded, okay, with, with interesting stuff. So he's saying first, dissatisfaction with the existing order. Second ingredient is this idea that the world is poorly organized and the problem is not us. And for instance, in the Christian tradition, the fact that we're marked by original sin and we're not perfectible and the world is a mess because of that and, and we have to just rely on God's grace but rather, the idea is that the world is poorly organized and it's given to us to do something about it, right? It is not us that's the problem. We actually are the solution. Then he says the third characteristic is the belief that salvation from the evil of the world is possible. So he's bro broken that out. But that's kind of implicit in the, in the second characteristic. We can escape from the evil of the world. So there, again, rejection of the idea of original sin is implicit there. Fourth, he says, from this follows the belief that the order of being will have to be changed in a historical process. From a wretched world to a good one must evolve historically. 
This assumption is not altogether self-evident because the Christian solution might also be considered, namely that the world throughout history will remain as it is, and that man's salvational fulfillment is brought about through grace in death. All right, so there now he's being very explicit about the contrast between the Gnostic and the Christian in his view. The Gnostic is somebody who says, we are going through a process that, and it's human driven of progress, and we will end up as extricating ourselves from our problems. Whereas in his view, Christianity's teaching is we are basically always going to need external salvation. There's no, no rising above it. Fifth, he says, the belief that a change in the order of being lies within the realm of human action and that this salvational act is possible through man's own effort. And then sixth, he says, it becomes the task of the Gnostics to seek out the prescription for such a change. Knowledge or gnosis of the method of altering being is the central concern of the Gnostic. As the sixth feature of the Gnostic attitude, therefore, we recognize the construction of a formula for self and world salvation. Okay, so he's broken it out very carefully. You see all the dimensions of the Gnostic thrust, basically, and you can hopefully see how the various mass movements meet all of those requirements. Then he makes a very interesting point on page 66, where he says the Gnostic mass movements derive their ideas of perfection from the Christian. And I guess, you know, many of them would deny that they have anything in common with Christian uh, ideals, right? So like, for instance, Marxism might deny that. Typically, a Marxist might deny that. Um, you know, a fascist might deny that. Um, even like a capitalist might deny that. Right. And say, no, you know, like it's empirical. It's, you know, our ideas are based on empirical evidence and on our observations of human nature and what it's capable of. OK, um, but he's saying, no, like the the uh, original dream, the original ideal is basically Christian. And all of these have become ersatz religions. They have become they have tried to become Christianity without uh, without Christ or without God, um, substituting Christ and or God with uh, man and with the historical process and with humans' efforts. And then he breaks it down a bit more and he says there's some variants of this way of thinking. One is teleological progress, which is characterized by thinkers like Kant, and I would say Marx fits in there. And then there's also the axiological variant, which is more where um, a thinker comes up with an ideal that's based upon his notion of, of human reason, what's truly rational. Thomas More would be an example of that, which he gives. Okay, So he uses Kant and More as examples of these two approaches. More had this hope that as people became more uh, literate and educated and rational, uh, that they that they would see the reason of reforming. And he tried to get Henry VIII to do this to no avail, right? He ends up being executed instead, but um, for other reasons, because he um, opposed Henry's marriage. But still, this does not ever stop people from coming up with these ideas, whether it's the teleological version or the axiological version, or there's another version, which is the combination of the two, which he calls activist mysticism. Of this third type, he says, it is a derivation of the two components as they are immanentized together. And there is present both a conception of the end goal and knowledge of the methods by which it is brought about. We shall speak of cases of this third type as activist mysticism. Under activist mysticism belong primarily movements that descend from Auguste Comte and Karl Marx. In both cases, one finds a relatively clear formulation of the state of perfection. In Comte, a final state of industrial society under the temporal rule of the managers and the spiritual rule of the positivist intellectuals. In Marx, a final state of classless a classless realm of freedom. And in both cases, there is a clarity about the way to perfection. For Comte, 
through the transformation of man into his highest form, a positivist man. For Marx, through the revolution of the proletariat and the transformation of man into the communist superman. Uh, Then there's a section on St. Augustine and Joachim of Flora or of Fiora, depending on what you read. Joachim's name is either Joachim of Fiora or of Flora. So if you think I'm wrong in my like in my spelling, look up the fact that there's like two different variants of this gentleman's name. So he turns first to the fourth century Christian thinker, Augustine. And he says of his thought, the phase of history since Christ was the sixth, the last earthly stage, the seculum senescens, the time of the senility of mankind. The present had no earthly future. Its meaning was exhausted in waiting for the end of history through eschatological events. So I take it that the, he's he's characterizing Augustine's thought in this way, and that would match up pretty closely with what Vogelin thinks is a genuine Christian position, that we are not capable of overcoming the uh, the flaws, the sin, and so forth, and we are relying upon the rescue, basically, of God through Christ. And so the times that we are living in for Augustine were were not, you know, extremely hopeful as far as humans' progress. Um, He does note that this was probably caused by the fact that Augustine was living through that period of time in which the Roman Empire was crumbling. So it did not appear that human beings were making progress. But then later, he says, 12th century Western European man saw progress starting to happen, right? Um, and this changed the, uh, the the mentality. And Joachim of Flora was a, a 12th century Christian figure. And so uh, Vogelin characterizes his way of thinking this way. He says the 12th century Western European man could not be satisfied with the view of a senile world waiting for its end, for his world was quite obviously not in its decline, but on the contrary, on the upsurge. And then he, it's very interesting, he he breaks down some of Joachim's symbols, Um that he says are still ours today, ways of thinking, you know, sort of sort of archetypal ways of thinking that are still embedded in our own mind and come from the earlier Christianity, but as it's interpreted through people who are now living in times of modernization. And Joaquin, one might argue, uh, was living through the very beginning of that uh, change. So he talks about how Joachim had four symbols that have remained, he says, the characteristic of political mass movements in our modern times. He says the first of these symbols is that of the third realm, that is the conception of a third world historical phase that is at the same time the last, the age of fulfillment. So he talks about how we tend to see things in these three stages, like ancient, medieval, and modern, right? Um, Or he says, in the 18th century, the three-phase laws made by Turgot and Comte made their appearance. The world history is divided into a first theological, a second metaphysical, and a third phase of positive science. Having just gotten done reading Vico, um, it seems like Vico has sort of a similar way of thinking in a way. He also mentions Hegel and Marx uh, in this regard. So that's the first of Joachim's symbols that he applied uh, to the development of Christianity, to the development of the social order. He says the second symbol Joachim developed is that of the leader who appears at the beginning of a new era and through his appearance justifies that era. So the world historical person or leader, like maybe um, Napoleon for Hegel. Um, And then he says third, of Joachim's symbols is that of the prophet. Joachim assumed that the leader of each age had a precursor, just as Christ had St. John the Baptist. And he says, these tend to be the intellectuals who start the mass movements. 
right? So he says, in the case of communism, also, it is difficult to separate leader and intellectual in the person of Karl Marx. But really, Marx was more of the intellectual. And then his ideas get taken up by leaders, and they sort of like translate them to their own immediate goals. And then off it goes from there uh, in the wrong direction, typically. He says, uh, but in the historical form of the movement, Marx and Engels have been distinguished by the great distance of a generation as precursors from Lenin and Stalin, uh, as leaders of the realization of the third realm. And then he says the fourth of the Huakite symbols is the community of spiritually autonomous persons. In the spirit of the monasticism of the time, Joachim imagined the third realm as a community of monks. But he says, the symbolism is most clearly recognizable in communism, where you get this ideal of everybody um, just sort of um, cooperating freely and equally. Um, and he says it's also the idea in democracy um, that it thrives not inconsiderably on the symbolism of a community of autonomous men in a democracy. And so the implication there is that all of these uh, are um, there. It's a narrative, right? A sort of like archetypal narrative um, that is deeply embedded in people's minds that stretches back to the uh, to, uh, you know, Christianity um, and becomes uh, transformed into social and political ideas, and then into ideologies, and people place like religious emphasis and religious energy onto uh, the intellectuals who start these movements, um, who are looked upon as ersatz prophets, and upon the leaders who are like almost like Christ-like figures, um, figures of uh, you know change that that usher in like monumental life transforming change uh, and bring about the end of, he doesn't use this term, but the end of history, the end of like the development of the historical progress. Okay. Um, and the end of that is the ultimate freedom, ultimate equality, ultimate happiness, no more need for change. And I guess crucially for him as a Christian thinker, no need for uh, salvation. So there you have it, um, Erzat's religion, uh, Vogelin's way of thinking goes along pretty well with Carl Jung's way of thinking on these matters. Uh, I find that interesting. I doubt Vogelin would probably want people to make the comparison, but nevertheless, uh, Vogelin stands in a tradition of thought about ideological mass movements as Erzatz religion. So uh, I hope you found this interesting. I might do one more on Vogelin. I will have to assess. Um, again, this is a Morin Academy podcast. Please check out more information about the Morin Academy. Sign up for our free newsletter. Support us on Patreon. Um, we really appreciate the support that we've gotten so far. We're really encouraged. We've got a great lineup coming up, which I'll talk about more. Um, but we've got stuff lined up for the fall that I think that you guys will really like, including, I'm just going to hint, potentially a session on Swifties and their social and psychological meaning in our existence.